With that, with that, I'll turn it over to Amy Tipler. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Journey to Innovation Libraries webinar. Uh, my name is Amy Tipler, and I'm the Continuing Education Coordinator here in the Bureau of Library Development for the Division of Library and Information Services. We have a great lineup of speakers, I'm very excited about this today, who will be sharing their innovative programs and services that won national awards and recognition. Um, today we have Erica from the Southern Adirondack Library System in New York State, Tony and Ryan from the Orange County Library System here in Florida, and Melanie from the Richland Library in South Carolina. Um, but I'm going to let them do the talking, introduce themselves, and go over their really, really amazing, outstanding programs. So without further ado, we'll begin with Erica. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so she can start. Well, good morning, y'all. It's nice to be here with you today. And today I'm going to be talking about how small rural libraries interested in improving adult literacy ended up reducing food waste, improving food access, and addressing food insecurity with the help of some really fabulous community partners. So our story starts in the summer of 2018, when a 76-year-old lifelong resident of Granville, New York, came into the Pember Library and Museum breathless. She had just had her first taste of a fresh beat and wanted to tell everybody about it. The experience of eating a fresh vegetable was so extraordinary, she'd returned to the library to talk about it because it's where she'd gotten it. And that's because the Pember Library is part of the Southern Adirondack Library System's Farm to Library program. I'm Erica Freudenberger, the Outreach, Engagement, and Marketing Consultant at the Southern Adirondack Library System in New York. And this kind of shows you the area that we cover. I work with 34 member libraries in uh, four rural counties, Hamilton, Saratoga, Warren, and Washington. Um, each of our 34 libraries is completely autonomous with its own board, budget, and director. And for um, those of you who are wondering where we are, because I know when people here in New York, they think of the city, we're about three and a half hours north of the city, and we share a border with Vermont. So we are quite rural. Um, our smallest library in Hamilton County serves 114 people. Our largest, which is what we call our urban library, serves 56,000, and that's in Glens Falls. Hamilton County, in case you're interested, is the least populated county east of the Mississippi with just 5,000 residents. It does not even have a stoplight anywhere. So that kind of gives you a sense of where we are. So why would a public library distribute fresh fruit and vegetables? It comes down to, we wanna help people live their best lives, which means sometimes meeting, helping people meet their basic needs to make space in their lives for adult literacy and other opportunities to learn and grow. It's really hard to think about taking your children to library programs or getting your GED when you're worried about putting food on the table. It's also because up to 40% of the food grown, processed, and transported in the United States, that's about 150,000 tons, is wasted each day. The cost of food loss is estimated to be about $218 billion each year, and 20 billion pounds of produce is lost on farms each year. Food waste is the most significant component of municipal landfills, emitting about 3.3 billion tons of greenhouse gases. And according to Food Foolish by Eric Schultz and John Mandyke, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after China and the US. So that tells you the impact that food waste can have. 16% of that waste comes from food loss, which means it never makes it off the farm. At the same time, 15 million households experience food insecurity which translates to about 50 million Americans, including 16 million kids. For people in rural communities, grocery shopping often occurs at a dollar store or a gas station where options are limited to highly processed foods. If there are healthy options, it might be a piece of fruit or a garnish in a prepared sandwich. 
there aren't grocery stores within walking distance. And in our area, there is zero public transportation and Uber does not exist. So families who have one car and that car is used to get to work, getting to a grocery store can be really, really difficult. Our libraries serve agricultural counties, yet despite an abundance of fresh local produce that's exported elsewhere, many people don't have access to the food that's grown nearby. A lot of our libraries are located in rural food deserts with limited access to nutritionally rich food where public transportation, as I mentioned before, is non-existent and there's no ride sharing services like Uber or Lyft. A lot of our communities do have food pantries, but they're entirely volunteer run for the most part. And they're usually open for either a couple hours a week or maybe a couple hours a month. And so because of their um, not being open every day, they're reluctant to start stock fresh food and vegetables and stick with shelf stable food. According to the Rural Sociological Society, nearly 98% of food deserts in the US are actually in non-metropolitan areas. And based on population counts, federal funding means rural, ac rural areas have fewer resources to address food insecurity and access. That leads to chronic disease and poor health, which often results in missed days at work, which means people are missing pay, which can be devastating to families. So given this set of challenges, what can small rural libraries do? So what we did is we partnered with the Comfort Food Community Food Pantry to develop the Farm to Library program. Last year, we expanded our program by partnering with Capital Root Squash Hunger Program to include libraries in the southern part of Saratoga County. Our service area covers 4,430 square miles. So it's a lot of territory to cover for a single community partner. The Farm to Library program is designed to rescue food from farms, improve health, and create space in people's lives to help them accomplish their larger goals. It begins by recruiting volunteers to glean produce from farms. Gleaners harvest the excess crops that would otherwise result in food waste. The rescued food is then cleaned, packed, and distributed to 10 libraries in rural food deserts, and as of this year, one urban library, and actually, as of yesterday, we're bringing on two more rural libraries. So it's gonna be a dozen rural libraries and one urban library. It can be a really heavy lift to find gleaners. Uh, we depend on volunteers. Gleaning has to be done really quickly so farmers can turn over their fields, usually later in the day. So this requires a really agile, dependable volunteer force willing to work early mornings in all sorts of weather. We got so incredibly lucky with Comfort Food Community they have a food recovery manager who coordinates that effort. All the volunteers are run through that. We help spread the word and recruit volunteers, but our libraries don't have to do the actual gleaning. So food recovery is a really um, critical component of this initiative. It rescues and diverts up to 1.1 million tons of waste each year. We're taking action at the top of the Environmental Protection Agency's food recovery hierarchy by using fresh food that would have otherwise been discarded or plowed under and distributing it to people who need it. So this initiative began all the way back in 2017 during a conversation with, uh, I was having with Glens Falls Hospital. It had recently purchased a van for Comfort Food Community, which had more fresh produce than it could distribute through its pantry. They wanted to reach people in rural food deserts, but didn't have the context to get started. I asked if they would consider distributing the food through our libraries. And at first they were really shocked. It had never occurred to them that we could play that role. And I wanna stress this, just because someone isn't doing it already or hadn't thought to include libraries, doesn't mean they aren't willing to work with us, right? There are tons of opportunities to collaborate on all sorts of issues that are that affect our communities and go ahead and seize them when you can and make your case for it. You never know what might happen. So we beta tested the idea with the Rockwell Falls Public Library, which serves two towns and two adjacent counties. Once a week, a van with fresh produce would stop the library for 20 minutes. In addition, volunteers from the library traveled to Glens Falls, which is the closest city 
about 30 minutes away over the mountain to a cooler where comfort food community dropped off produce. So the good news is that people got fresh fruit and vegetables, but it was definitely a bumpy start. Since funding was coming from the state, participants had to demonstrate need through an income qualification. I was really reluctant to implement it, but our community partners were obligated to meet the grant requirements. I weighed it against the possibility of improving people's lives and developing a relationship with comfort food community, and I acquiesced to it. And I'll admit it was not my finest moment. Comfort food community had 20 stops that it was doing in this big route to distribute food. And each visit lasted 20 minutes. As you may imagine, a 20 minute window in the middle of the day was not the best way to reach people. And if the van was running off schedule, which it frequently did, people either had to sit around and wait or worse, if it arrived early, they missed their chance altogether. So the pilot year was not perfect, but we learned a lot. All of the library staff, including the director, qualified for the program which says a lot about wages in small rural libraries. We also learned that despite what experts in serving this community told us, people have an unquenchable desire for fresh fruit and produce, and were really willing to try things that they didn't recognize if provided with a bit of guidance. And I wanna point out that people who work with marginalized communities are human, and we all bring biases to our work. Experts told me repeatedly that people experiencing food insecurity wouldn't want fresh fruits and vegetables because their palates had adapted to prefer sugary processed foods. I wanna be very clear, this information is false and it's harmful. Our experience demonstrates all people enjoy having fresh fruit and vegetables and some of our most eager eaters are children. People who have obstacles in their lives have a right to good, healthy food and if we can help provide that, let's do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So <clears throat> after our pilot year, the new incarnation of Farm to Library had several significant changes. The first was there was no qualification to enjoy the food. We encouraged everyone to help themselves to remove any stigma or shame. Food is available for all to share. People can come in and take a clove of, or a um, yeah, a clove of garlic for uh, dinner or some apples or load up on lettuce, whatever they want. Our goal is to bring new people into the library and build community through sharing food and swapping recipes and stories. The second change was delivering the fresh food directly to the libraries. Our libraries have limited funding and hours, but are still open more often and are more accessible than our local food pantries and we can work in concert with them. We launched our program with cooking classes by Cornell Cooperative Extension, and we shared recipes for how to cook the food and laminated pictures identifying the different fruits and vegetables with information about how to cook and store them. So in the past five years, the program has really mushroomed. During the pandemic, we continued to share food through curbside pickup. And as the infection, infection rate slowed, we were able to restock the farm to library refrigerators. Because we've seen a really dramatic rise in unemployment and food insecurity, our libraries have been busier than ever. We added more libraries to the program in 2020, including some outside of Comfort Foods Community Service Area. So in 2021, we brought on the Stillwater and Waterford Public Libraries by partnering with the Squash Hunger Program. We now have 11 participating library, well, actually, as of this week, 13, and um, are bringing on another urban library, so that'll be 14 altogether. At the end of 2021, we had shared more than 37,000 pounds of fresh food with more than 8,700 people. And this year, the, Cran the Crandall Library in Glens Falls is coming on board, and this library serves the largest population in our system. I mentioned 56,000 people live in this city with a 16% poverty rate. So I won't be surprised if we double or triple our numbers this year, which I'm excited about. So as the project grows, so do the opportunities. The Pember Library is in Granville, which borders Vermont. Because of harsh winters, year-round deliveries are not possible. And, um, oh, it looks like I dropped a slide, so I apologize for that. Um, 
the Glens Falls Hospital provided funding to the Pember to purchase a grow tower, which is very cool. And I wish I did have a picture of it. Um, <clears throat> the library started with seeds. And once the seeds are sprouted, they place them in the grow tower, which allows them to provide fresh greens and herbs for their patrons year round. The Greenwich Free Library partnered with Comfort Food to create an edible education series. Oh, hang on. I'm just, I'm so sorry, everybody. I'm all messed up. Here is the Grow Tower. There we go. All righty. This is the edible education program for adults and kids. The first adult class took place in the food pantry's professional kitchen. It taught people how to make cheese using items from the food pantry. And Comfort Food Community also came to the library to teach kids how to prepare and enjoy vegetables at toddler story times. And as you can see, it was a huge hit. So the library in turn provides early literacy services at the food pantry. This model of food-based community outreach is based on the really excellent work done by Betsy Kennedy at the Casanova Public Library. She began providing early literacy programs at a food pantry in central New York and now graduates multiple high school equivalent equivalency classes several times a year. So scarcity is a myth that we need to vanquish. More surplus food is available at local farms and within the food system than we can distribute. There's no reason for anyone to go hungry and not to be well nourished. This initiative wouldn't be possible without volunteers who get up at 5 a.m. to glean, without partners like Comfort Food Community and Squash Hunger, or member libraries in our communities. As people come by to pick up garlic or quarter blueberries, they drop off a couple dozen eggs from their chickens. People share overflow from their gardens. Um, and in the past six years, we've shared more than 50,000 pounds of food. In addition to re reducing food waste, improving food access and reducing food insecurity, we're seeing new patrons at our libraries who come to grab fresh food and return to use computers, attend a program or borrow material. When the world seems exceptionally chaotic and overwhelming, it's really nice to remember that sometimes doing something as simple as sharing food creates a common bond, reminding us of our humanity and our need to care for each other. While this work benefits our local community, it also corresponds to the sustainable development goals established by the United Nations. By joining with other stakeholders, we can ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns, reduce inequalities, and contribute to improved health and well being. By partnering with other stakeholders, we can change the world, one community and one library at a time. And what could be more delicious? So in the end, our goal is to save the planet, feed the people and become better readers. And if you have any questions about this or are interested in getting started, please always get in touch. And there are also some resources for you to enjoy. And we'll be sharing out her slides so everyone has um access to these references and resources. We have a few minutes now. Does anyone have any questions for Erica? I'll just wait just in case someone's typing. All right, so the first question, do you use the same program to do seed sharing from people's gardens? So we are not doing seed sharing through, um, so I should, like I support our 34 member libraries. Some of our libraries may do seed sharing, but I'm not organizing a system-wide seed sharing at this point, maybe as the, as the program continues to grow. And then uh, Dolly said, I want a copy of your mission statement about saving the planet and sharing food. <laughs> and then Claudia asks, how do you or do you limit the, how much food a patron takes? Oh, that's a really great question. So we do not place any limits on what people take. I will say that when we first started, and this usually happens, we see this happen sometimes when we start in a new community at a new library. Initially, there might be some hoarding behavior where people take a lot, a lot more than what they can perhaps handle on their own. But once they realize that this is a regular weekly program and that there's always going to be fresh produce available, that behavior has self-corrected. 
So we haven't had any issues with that and we don't limit what people can take. And also I should say, people are getting really, really great stuff. It's all fresh. I mean, like they're big quarts of berries and all sorts of really good things. So it's fun to share. People get excited about it. Yeah, it seems like a really amazing program. Uh, we don't have any other questions right now. Um, so we'll move on to Tony and Ryan. Hello, everyone. Get my screen situated here. Hi, everyone. Oh, thank you, Amy, and um, hello. Uh, my name is Tony Orengo, and I'm joined today by Ryan Bachin, uh, and we are a part of the Orange County Library System in the mostly sunny Orlando, Florida. Um, our team support the library's technology and education program, uh, which focuses on presenting technology and creative classes to students of all ages and skill levels. And so today we are super grateful uh, for the opportunity to share the story of Biscuits, our business and entrepreneurship program for youth. As community hubs, uh, libraries provide access to resources and learning opportunities to all uh, by helping neutralize the boundaries associated with socioeconomic status, including the digital divide and limited access to basic services. Youth entrepreneurial programs and libraries help youth become more aware of the opportunities that exist around them and also gain confidence in their ability to obtain economic empowerment through entrepreneurship. In 2017, we launched the series of courses we called BizKids, a program that introduces kids ages 9 to 14 to the worlds of business and entrepreneurship. Through a series of instructor-led sessions presented by library staff, uh, BizKids participants learn to brainstorm business ideas, create business plans and budgets, marketing collateral, as well as how to pitch their business idea to potential investors like the shark in the show. Uh, in each session, uh, students are guided through a series of fun, hands-on activities and memorable role-playing exercises. They learn how to use Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint to create flyers, business presentations, and budget and inventory spreadsheets. Uh, along the way, they also learn important life skills uh, such as critical thinking, communication, and collaboration skills. We started small uh, when we launched, uh, but we knew right away that we wanted to create an immersive experience for our students. Uh, so to that end, we collaborated with the Friends of the Library organization that runs our gift shop and local business owners and entrepreneurs. Uh, these collaborations uh, led to students being able to partake uh, in some pretty unique experiences, uh, like an opportunity to work the library's gift shop, uh, learning effective customer service skills there, merchandising, and using uh, a cash register. Um, speaking of his experience, an 11-year-old, I must stress, 11-year-old student shared, my experience has been unlike anything I've ever experienced before. It was exciting to work at an actual store for the first time. It's an experience you can only get here at the library, BizKids. You can't do this anywhere else. I promise those are, those are his words. We didn't incentivize him in any way, uh, but he was really excited uh, to uh, participate in BizKids. Um, we uh, also uh, presented a fair um, and we wanted to take our students experience further. Um, so we wanted them to be able to grab or take the skills that they learned in our BizKids program and be able to put them into practice uh, at a business fair. Uh, so we launched the Orlando Children's Business Fair uh, later that year. Uh, and this fair challenges participants to create a product or a service develop a brand and marketing strategy, and then launch a business. Um, so you could think of the fair as a lively um, market. Uh, this uh, challenge that we put out to students was enthusiastically accepted and embraced, not only by the participants, but also by their entire families. And that to me was one of the more notable aspects of the um, experience, being able to create a, a moment, a time, a space where families could work together. 
Uh, so together they worked to prepare and organize everything that they needed to launch their business at the fair. The day of the fair, we had one simple rule, which was friends and family were invited to join and support the kids, but we wanted our young entrepreneurs to be the ones presenting their products and interacting with customers. Each year, we are simply blown away. We've had an opportunity now to host this several years, and um, we're blown away by the creativity and ingenuity of participants. Uh, they set up shop to sell beautiful artwork, handmade soaps, delicious baked goods, uh, jewelry, uh, some made with really clever materials like Legos, uh, and so much more. We conduct each of these uh, or conclude uh, each of these fairs uh, with a ceremony uh, because we want to recognize and celebrate all participants. Uh, so the library works with uh, local business leaders to identify judges and mentors who meet with students, provide them with feedback, and help select award recipients. Our aim is to encourage uh, participants to continue chasing their dreams, uh, believing in themselves and all that they can achieve uh, with hard work and dedication. Since launching, more than 120 youth-run businesses have been showcased at the fair, and more than 2,000 community members have attended to support our young entrepreneurs. You can see they're, uh, they're super happy there with their oversized uh, little checks. Dr. Marisa Macy of the UCF's Early Childhood uh, Development and Education Program, she shared this, these kind, kind words with us. Um, I thought you all did such an amazing job supporting the students, uh, but also empowering them with information about financial literacy, entrepreneurship vocabulary, and the ideas that spark so much creativity and wonder. Biz Kids covers so many things we try to do in encouraging childhood development in academics and human development. What a great opportunity. One of the uh, participants, her name was Celeste, she shared, this is one of the best memories I've had in my entire life. Uh, and Celeste, um, she's gone on to register a trademark, uh, publish a book, and support the work of nonprofits. Uh, her mother shared that the experience helps young people realize that they are impactful, that they can make a difference in their life, and sometimes in the lives of others. Celeste was kind enough that after she participated in the program in the market, she came back and served as a judge and mentor to some of the other kids. Um, so that came around full circle for us. Um, the Biscuits program has really been an enriching and a memorable uh, experience for everyone involved. Uh, it's been really rewarding uh, to see participants leave this experience with a smile on their face and sometimes with a few extra dollars in their pockets, but more importantly, to see them leave with a sense of empowerment and accomplishment. Uh, it really has. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, uh, I mean, as one can imagine, you can go through these experiences, you can hear about these comments, and it's, it's really a shared sentiment that kind of pours in from all across the community leaders, our local business owners, uh, parents, caregivers, uh, attendees of both the Biz Kids classes and the fair that Tony just mentioned. Um, and little did we know, you know, in 2017, when this started, that these positive remarks that were left were early indicators of maybe this program being a very powerful impact uh, and having a a great future growth ahead of itself and, and maybe setting the course of the trajectory. Um, so in 2018, the following year, we were thrilled then to be acknowledged at this level uh, by the Public Library Association through receiving the Innovation Award, recognizing these strides in introducing young people to classes, events, uh, which focus more on the developing of these entrepreneurial skills, such as marketing, finance, pitching to investors, which oftentimes became, were the uh, close relatives and families of the caregivers uh, of these students. Uh, this recognition may have then added fuel to our next endeavor. Uh, and this leads us to 2019, where we were able to expand on the Biz Kids to further uh, its impact into the community. And so, driven by a passionate team building upon that momentum of biz kids 
we successfully applied and for a county funded grant to provide financial innovation programming for youth, that's the exact title, uh, in these select sectors, which were identified by the county. So these five areas are areas that were identified by our government as areas in need of this particular service. And once we found out that this was offered and, and available for us to maybe potentially leverage um, what we've already had um, in 2017 and 2018, we then had to uh, want to fulfill these services and creating uh, a replica of this to then go out into these communities and be able to offer these services. So we were excited to meet the needs of this grant through having a program already in place that was previously developed specifically around this targeted age that the grant was for. And without any prior knowledge of that grant or its initiative, uh, Biscuit seemed to have perfectly lined up right where it needed to be at the right time uh, to fulfill that grant's needs in the community. So through this grant, we were able to continue developing that curriculum, uh, training our instructors, and uh, purchasing portable classroom equipment, including laptops, projectors. Um, one obstacle we did have uh, that we identified really early on were the constraints of these sectors and uh, the people that we would be serving. And so that deals with food, transportation. And even though there is a, a general acknowledgement of constraints like these, we sometimes do underestimate how powerful those constraints can be. So. Thankfully, we planned in advance, included in the assessment of our grant proposal and uh, included the ability to offer classes outside of the library, in some cases in residential apartment complexes, uh, community centers, uh, providing meals, offering free bus passes, even seed money for students to offer uh, or to launch their businesses. Uh, due to these funds received, we are very proud of the outcome, the ability to maximize that potential of this program that started in 2017 to our community. Um, displayed here, you are looking at a few images that of young entrepreneurs uh, mentoring one another, receiving tangible experiences in sales of their artwork and uh, baked goods and, and even soaps and Legos and virtual escape rooms even. Uh, launching a fashion line. Um, I love the inspirational quotes that were uh, built in the process. Uh, these images also display our fantastic instructors who have uh, poured uh, their heart into the class sessions, assisting children uh, to understand business concepts and how to even market their business and pitch to investors. Uh, the, the program really has brought out the best in everyone involved and, and anyone that was witnessing or around that uh, could testify uh, to these, uh, to the kids and, and what they are capable of. One of the key takeaways for us is, you know, even through receiving the funding and, and it really did help expand the offering, we are thankful to be maybe ahead of the curve uh, and having created the courses and trained the that our instructors and, and be able to offer these elements to kids prior to even the opportunity of this grant arriving. Um, it really did start with our amazing staff who sought after designing innovative classes. And in a matter of a few short years, it has evolved to what it is today. As we expanded in 2019, if we are following the timeline correctly here, uh, we like many others soon faced new challenges as the world drastically shifted in the following year. Uh, this is our time where we had to maybe outshine a little bit and come together with the virtual elements of the uh, program. So after taking some time to reevaluate how this program may work virtually, we took a step back, zoomed out, and analyzed what made it so successful to begin with. Um, and so we identified some progresses that we made in class, such as developing a business idea, learning what a brand is, creating a budget. And with these you know, selected key areas where students gain much knowledge from and partnering that with their end goals of starting a business from scratch, we 
quickly utilized those elements and pivoted to offering this experience in an online environment. Um, and to much surprise, attendees loved it. Uh, this did require work on the back end, redesigning a curriculum, obviously, to be an online formatted version, um, having file assets made available in shared drives, retraining instructors, providing supports and guides to assist staff on even how to host and present in this new world. Uh, what we did find out is that we should have known better uh, because kids are going to get creative in any environment they are put in. Uh, and this was proven true once again, um, where they were put together in virtual rooms, discussing business ideas, uh, companies that were successful, unsuccessful, what made them great, what didn't, uh, and, and even met with local business owners in the community who were also going through those challenges during the pandemic and were able to answer questions and provide insight and maybe even be a mentor in that element um, during this uh, these uh, virtual biz kids sessions. So as seen here, you, you are looking at a few virtual classes that were happening and some of the um, products and discussions that were created and uh, slide presentations that were made to facilitate and draft businesses. Um, and we're really proud. We're proud of this uh, to continue offering the same excellent service that we have been to our patrons uh, in person right here in Orange County, Florida. Which brings me to this a uh, bit here. I mean, through the inception of the Biz Kids program, uh, through its classes and the fairs and creating it virtually in 2017 uh, to the PLA recognition of 2018, the grant uh, assisted expansion in 2019, and then dealing with the virtual world of 2020 and 2021, uh, we calculate that we've led over 450 new young entrepreneurs within the Central Florida community. Uh, and we are elated not only uh, about that number, but the impact that really has on others. And so uh, I'll leave you with this quote here. Uh, and it says, uh, this was an outstanding multi-class session. The OCLS instructors were amazing. They were so caring. They knew the content really, really, really well and inspired learning. Fantastic OCLS team. And lastly, I will share a video here with you. Ready to become an entrepreneur? Join the Biz Kids Club, a 10-session instructor-led program that introduces middle school students to the world of business and entrepreneurship. Create a business plan, design marketing materials, practice customer service skills, and launch a business. Two dollars, please. I have a great assortment of of Lego necklaces, earrings, bracelets. I sell cotton bottles and stress balls. This teaches skills that you don't necessarily get in school. I've learned how to save money, how to make profit. And she's so happy because she can make their, her own sale by herself. The kids get to first hand to experience customers, transactions. I think as a parent, it's fun to see him do this and thrive. I want to be an entrepreneur so I could make better technology for people and the community. It was a really fun experience. You should definitely join it. For more information or to register, visit ocls.info slash bizkidsclub. So I don't know how we're doing on time, Amy, um, but I do see a few questions and I can go ahead and maybe answer a few of those. Yeah, definitely go right ahead. Okay. Um, uh, Melanie left uh, a comment on um, uh, NFTE certified uh, or affiliate. Um, I don't believe any of us are uh, the networking uh, or network for teaching entrepreneurship. Thank you for popping that site in there because we will research that a little bit further. And this is obviously why we love being part of panels or being part of just discussions and rooms like this because we can just always learn from something else. So we will definitely look into that further and see if we can uh, expand on that. Um, uh, Claudia, I think you're the, oh, maybe I have a couple of questions here. So um, let me go 
backwards from that. Uh, securing external funding came from our, the Orange County government uh, of, uh, of Florida. Uh, there was a certain areas that, uh, that we needed to meet and the ones that we went after was that um, financial uh, literacy area for, uh, for the youth. And uh, the age range, um, I believe it was nine to 12. Tony, feel free to correct me. I believe that was the age range of what we wrote into the grant, but also even before that, it was uh, a part of that. And so we modified that as we needed for the grant purposes. Um, uh, Tony may have a little bit more insight on some of the numbers as he's worked with, he's one of the curriculum developers and he's worked very uh, closely with some of the instructors, but um, I would yeah, say well over 10. Correct. Yeah. And in terms of the numbers, it really does depend on the, the stage we find ourselves in. Um, so early on, uh, my colleague and I worked on the development of the curriculum. Uh, and as we prepared to implement the program, um, initially, um, we, we noted earlier in the presentation, we started small. Um, so we really just had um, two instructors um, dedicated to the program uh, at one of our locations. And as the program grew and as we were able to secure additional funding, uh, we were able to expand that to various locations in our system. Uh, but typically it is two staff members uh, and we set a capacity of 16 students uh, per each uh, club. And uh, so that's generally how we work that. And the sessions are eight sessions and they're each about an hour and a half. And uh, so that hopefully gives you a little sense of just the time allotted and the uh, staff members involved. And then there was one more question about, um, you had mentioned that one of your students had written a book. Do you have the title of that? I will be happy to look, uh, look, look for that and maybe we can make that available to you a little bit later. Um, but it was a self-published book um, and it, it probably is uh, accessible through an Amazon search. Um, so her name's Celeste. Um, and so if I'm able to find that title a little later, I'll share it with Amy and maybe we can get that to you a little later on. But we're really proud of her. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tony and Ryan. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so we can uh, move on to Melanie. Hey, everybody. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, I am going to share my screen and, and back clean up here of all these great ideas. So um, let's see if we can get my slides up and play from the start. How's that? Am I good? Um, it looks great. Thank you. So hey, everybody. I'm Melanie Huggins. I'm the CEO of Richland Library. We are in Columbia, South Carolina. It's the capital city right smack dab in the middle of the state, a beautiful state of South Carolina. Um, we, our, our library system won the national medal um, for from the Institute of Museum and Library Services in 2017. And so what I'm going to share briefly with you today are just some of the reasons that I think we won the medal, some of the things that were in our application. Um, I've been the library director for 13 years now, and when I got here in 2009, there was a Knight Foundation report um, of all cities that are considered night cities of which are, that used to have a night Ritter newspaper of which Columbia, South Carolina is one. Um, that report was called Soul of the City, and it really told a story about how people feel about the places that they live. And one of the things that we that really jumped out at me about that report was that Columbia, South Carolina, which is about almost 500,000 people, we're 700 square miles, we have rural, urban, and suburban libraries, there's 13 libraries here, and the main library of, of which you're seeing some images from here. Um, what we learned about Columbia was that people didn't always feel welcomed here. We weren't a very inclusive city. Um, and, and that was important in 2009. It's even more important today when people can live anywhere they want. They are not bound by where their job is. And we know that the pandemic has even exponentially um, changed how people think about where they live, work, and play. So one of the things we knew very early on was that we needed to be seen as, the library needed to be seen, as an organization whose role it was to attract 
and retain talent here in the city. And one way that we really wanted to focus on that is by providing a space for creatives, artists, um, and people who um, make want to make their living through their art can thrive and grow and connect with one another. So we have several programs that really focus on creating an inclusive community. The image that you're seeing on the screen here is one from an uh, from a um, an event that we did pre pandemic and we're actually just starting back up again called Overdue. Overdue is an evening where we close the library um, down at you know, 5.30 on a Friday, but we open it back up again from seven to midnight. And we create this really inclusive environment where people can come in and have a beer and see um, and experience what the library has to offer in a really fun, low-key environment. We have local artists and musicians and our staff you know, guiding through people through the activity. It's a great way for people to get exposed to the equipment and the technology and learn things about us and themselves that they may not otherwise know. I'm always struck by this event and how diverse the group of people that come to the event are. Um, you'll see a variety of ages, uh, genders, um, just, uh, it's really striking. It's just this beauty of our community. And we've built this event up over time because one of the things that um, we, we want to make sure that people understand about Richland Library is that we're, we're here for creatives, but we're also in the problem solving business, the community problem solving business. And one of the things that we think got us the national medal was an event that we created called Do Good Columbia. And Do Good Columbia is a community problem solving event. And we at our library system are very immersed in human centered design. And we have several um, staff who are really great at leading people through design thinking challenges and processes. And we do it, we use it all the time internally, but we wanted to turn that inside out and use the community how to use these tools. So we had these beautiful spaces and we thought what problem that is about inclusive communities could we solve? And we kind of crowdsourced the problem. And what we found was that we, like a lot of cities, um, have three rivers that run through our city that have been kind of ignored and neglected. Like a lot of communities, they didn't know what to do with their rivers. They became places to build, in our case, chicken plant or low income housing and, and things that just really, um, they didn't treat rivers like assets. And you, you can see that in cities like Kansas City and Chattanooga, where they're really trying to focus on reinvesting in riverfront. So for Duke of Columbia, we issued the challenge. We said, how can we make our rivers more accessible, more enjoyable to our residents? We opened up that challenge to volunteers to come spend two and a half days with us here in Richland Library. We put them in teams of 13. We, we had a diverse group of demographics, a diverse group of uh, participants, and we, we gave them personas that they were designing for, whether those personas were people who were doing sustenance fishing on the river or somebody who just wanted to kayak down the river. And we picked five different river sites. We gave them a site, we gave them a persona, we put the team together, and for two and a half days, they worked to design an experience um, that had some constraints. It could not be something that was multi-million dollars that would cost to execute. They had to design something that could happen between six months and a year from the day that the, the project was over, that the Do Good Columbia was over. At the end of Do Good Columbia, the 13 teams gave their pitches. And here you see Bill, he's given his, his team's pitch about their idea for how to make the river more enjoyable and accessible. And those um, pitches uh, were judged by some pretty influential people here in the community, people who are real estate developers that own some of this property, people who are uh, philanthropic um, organizations and people who want to see um, uh, the river invested in and see it more um, enjoyed by everyone. And the resulting team that won got $50,000 to turn their project into um, a reality. And what you're seeing right now are images 
announcements from the winning site and the winning team and the kickoff we had when we unveiled the public art that the money paid for, the new signage that tells the history of the river, the beer garden program. We changed the zoning law so we could have beer at the river. So that was one of the outcomes of this and that we have beer gardens now and the hammocks were bought with the money. And all of that money came from a grant that the library wrote. We used the money to design the two and a half day event. And we also then gave the money away to a team to actually make it happen. So again, how can we be more welcoming, inclusive as a community? Um, we also focus a lot of the work that we do in our studios, and we have multiple studios in our library on people who want to make their living as a creative, whether that's culinary or sewing or designing. And so again, how can we attract, retain talent here in Columbia, South Carolina? And the other thing that I wanted to just really briefly mention is the other reason I think we won the national medal is because of our crisis response. And um, this is a picture from 2015. Um, it blows me away every time I look at it. You can see the street signs. We, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, experienced a thousand year flood. Um, and so the library leapt in just like everybody else did into crisis response. We worked with uh, Jim Clyburn's office to make sure that FEMA was represented represented heavily here in our libraries. 14% of all FEMA applications in the state of South Carolina came from public libraries um, during that time and during public libraries in Richland County. Um, just, I loved hearing about Erica's program because we also jumped in with our food share partners and started giving food away um, through using our delivery vehicles to do that. And we still do that to this day, but it was part of our crisis response. We also partnered with churches and used our delivery vans um, to go to those churches that were collecting water and baby formula and diapers to pick those things up and get them as close to those isolated and stranded communities as we could possibly do that, having the National Guard help us deliver those materials. And then um, I just want to mention the other part of crisis response that I think also is something that we're known for is in 2015, not only did we have the flood, but earlier that year, um, 90 minutes away from us at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, we had the murder of these nine parishioners. And that really is what started our conversations about racial equity in our community and how we could help the community heal. It, it shook our whole state. Of course, you all dealt with this in 2020. Um, as we, as the murder of George Floyd and several other um, Black uh, citizens got us all mobilized around how we could have these conversations. And out of that, our crisis response was to create our Let's Talk Race program. And so that's the other thing that I think um, was, was part of us winning the National Medal is that we have trained facilitators on staff who coordinate conversations about racial equity. Um, we also use virtual reality to help build empathy among our community on, on a variety of topics, not just social justice and racial equity, but some of those you see here on the on the screen. Um, the pan that prepared us for a pandemic response, obviously. I'm just going to flip through. You've all responded to the pandemic in wonderful ways. But I want to just end with this last slide, which is kind of a culmination of that creative, inclusive community and crisis response. During the pandemic, one of the things that we knew was that our local musicians had no gigs to play at. There was no way for people who were making their their living as a musician to play. So we started paying them um, to do what we called one or two sessions, just putting one or two musicians together or having a kind of pared down version of their band or whatever. Um, they started playing. We recorded those and we shared those. It was a it was a collaboration with One Columbia for Arts and Culture and the Post and Courier newspaper, and we re and we shared those um, videos um, in our collection. You can still access them. I'll, I'll throw up a link so you can see some of them. So we were recording those, paying those artists for their work during the pandemic when they could not. Um, perform. Um, and then in June of last year, when we thought the pandemic was nearing an end before Omicron and all of that, we actually had an in-person event. And this is that happening um, at one of our partners facilities where we invited all the people who did one or two sessions to come play a few songs from their set live and in person. And this really did feel like the coming out party. And we were so starved to be around each other. It just felt fabulous. So this is what this image is. It's like the, you know, supporting creatives and the crisis response kind of all coming together in the end. So 
Uh, it was really fast, but I know we are short on time. So I just wanted to make sure I could wrap it up um, before then. So I will stop sharing my screen and see if people have questions for me. Yes, thank you so much, Melanie. Um, we did have a few questions. Um, Claudia asked, where did you secure external funding? I think she asked that during the food sharing portion. Uh, so I so I will tell you this the food sharing piece is a partnership that we we do not have to pay for the food that comes from the the food share program and we also have farmers markets at our libraries where we we um, accept SNAP dollars. If you're talking about the funding for Duke of Columbia, that came from our local community foundation. We got a seventy five thousand dollar grant. Um, from them, we, we matched it with some of our friends and foundation money to put the two and a half day event on of Do Good Columbia, but we used $50,000 of that $75 grant to use towards the winning idea. And I can send back to you, Amy, a list of the um, the technologies that we use for the Empathy Lab. We also, that was also grant funded as well. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Did you have um, specific programs that you did with the VR to cultivate empathy? Was it specified or? Um, you know, it's just a, we call it the mobile empathy lab. And we have done them um, both at main library and as pop-up things in the branches. And we actually, if you were at PLA, we set up some of the equipment at PLA so people could test it out as well. Um, and we, you, you can use different stories. We had one that was about um, Syrian refugees. Um, we have one that's about homelessness. Uh, we, we, and so they just, you know, we, we have a staff that kind of tells you what you're about to do. And it's really for adults. We have not done it with kids yet because the topics are pretty heavy. Um, so you have a staff member that kind of prepares you for the experience. You sit down in a quiet space, you put on the equipment, you experience it. And we had some follow-up as well. We had people get very emotional about these things. So we had to kind of prepare for, you know, what kind of support they would need. Um, and so I can, like I said, I can send a list of the equipment that it takes to do the empathy lab. And then some of the stories that we used and where we've gotten those. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for, for Melanie or any of the other presenters as well? The last thing is just a link to our catalog. We use Biblioboard and we have our one or two, a lot of our one or two session videos in our catalog. So if you're interested in going, going to see some of the talent, um, you can actually search those and, and bring up those videos. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I don't see any other questions. Um, we really appreciate everything that the presenters have shared with us today. They're all really great programs. Um, and this has been a fantastic thing to, to learn and be inspired by. So I really appreciate the presenters time and the attendees time. Um, if anyone does have any more questions that they think of um, after, I can always shoot them to the presenters and share them out with everyone. Um, and we'll share out the notes and things like that as well in the recording. Um, but with that, thank you, everyone. Have a great day.